chasing Al-Qaeda from Afghanistan. <laughs> Hunting down Saddam Hussein across Iraq. Bombing Colonel Gaddafi out of Libya. Could Syria be next? Or have Western powers lost their ability to win wars abroad? My guest tonight thinks they didn't always achieve what they set out to do, but won't admit failure. Nicknamed Darth Vader by his men, General Sir Mike Jackson was Britain's top soldier during the invasion of Iraq. I'm Mehdi Hassan, and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head to head with General Sir Mike Jackson over the West's military track record from Kosovo to Kabul. I'll be asking him if Western powers have a right to intervene in faraway countries and whether humanitarian and strategic objectives can ever be reconciled. I'll be joined in this discussion by three experts. Frank Ledwidge, a former British military intelligence officer turned author and anti-war activist. Nadeem Shahadi, a Middle East specialist at the foreign policy think tank Chatham House. And Deborah Haynes, defense editor of the Times of London. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest tonight, General Sir Mike Jackson. Good evening, thanks for coming. General Jackson, we're talking about some of the big conflicts tonight. Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Kosovo. On what basis do you think the West gets to intervene in these places in the first place? By what right? I mean, British and American governments have troops stationed in hundreds of countries across the world. And a lot of people say, why? Who made them the world's policemen? Nobody, other than perhaps circumstance. It's not just the West, but it's fair to say, I think, that only the West has that ability to influence events uh, far from uh, their own shores. I think lying behind your question is, should they be doing this rather than... Uh, well, it's always going to be controversial, in some cases more so than others. Just taking your point <laughs> on strategic deployment, yeah. about being able to do this. Yes. Syria is one country which yes. is in a real mess. There's been a great deal of talk about military intervention, whether it's doable, possible. You are one of Britain's best-known generals. If David Cameron, the Prime Minister, came to you and said, Mike Jackson, what should we do in Syria? Is there a military intervention that will work? What would you say to him? Uh, probably not to. Why? Because we are now seeing the sectarian war in the Middle East as between Sunni and Shia. And I don't think this is necessarily a place where Western intervention is, is going to help. I don't think it will necessarily, in my own personal test, can we leave it better than we found it? One of the reasons why public opinion in the West is so hostile towards intervening in Syria is the legacy of Iraq. That's still there hanging over a lot of this. Is it true, by the way, that you became head of the British Army a month before the invasion? Yeah, thereabouts. That's a baptism of fire indeed, yeah. to get the top job just as we're going to Well, I, I had the number two job before, so one was completely involved in You were the, ready to go. Well, more than a, you talked about leaving things better than when you found them. Do you think the Iraq war was worth it? We will never know, because we did it. What we will never know is what Iraq would have been like had we not, and had Saddam Hussein and his two revolting sons continued in their pretty bestial behaviour. We will never know. Even despite the civilian death toll, the sectarian strife, the regional instability, the failure to find weapons of mass destruction, you still think it was the right thing to do? It's right and wrong to me is, is far too... It's far too simplistic. Um, do you mean legally right? Uh, that's, that's part of your question. So you believe the war was legal at the time in 2000? I did. And yet Kofi Annan said it was illegal. The UN Secretary General at the yes. time, the you Dutch government inquiry yeah. said it was illegal. Um, I'm sure there are many lawyers. International lawyers did say it was and, illegal. And many said it was the other way. And what was your basis for saying it was legal? I took my view in the light of, indeed, the Attorney General's second opinion in this country. And if, it, if you had come to the conclusion 
as many others did, that it was illegal, that it was a violation of international law, would you have refused to obey the orders given to you? As a senior officer in the armed forces of a mature democracy such as we are fortunate enough to be in, um, yes, your job is to give your military advice, is to explain how a political objective might be achieved, wholly perhaps, unlikely, but partly by the use of military force. But if that advice is not taken, or it's overruled, or whatever, um, your constitutional position is utterly clear. You either bite your lip and get on with it, or you say you'll have to find somebody else to do this. Mm. So I'm asking you, would you, had you believed it was illegal, would you have said, I'm not doing this, I'm not having any Had I believed so, I'd have had no choice. Between 2003, when we went in, and 2011, when British troops pulled out, can you tell me how many Iraqi civilians were killed by British bombs or bullets? I didn't think a number can possibly be established. Can you give me an estimate? No. Why not? Because I, I don't know. Shouldn't you know? I think it's impossible to distinguish who killed whom in a very messy and difficult situation. I don't know. Do you think army should do body counts? An American general famously said, we don't do body counts. Uh, there, have been, I, there have been lots yeah. of estimates from epidemiologists, uh, I academics, have, I have the Lancet this. Medical Journal. Yes, Some say half uh, a million Iraqis were killed. That's uh, an astonishing I, I have no idea of the evidence for that. But when you see those numbers, how does that make you feel? Well, I think you're driving at the sort of cost-benefit of intervention and casualties. I don't look at it like that. And it's, it's simply not possible how to come out with this How can you evaluate whether a war was a good thing or a bad thing or right or wrong if you don't know how many innocent people died in it? How can I possibly judge overall whether a person in Iraq, an Iraqi, was killed because he was, or she, had taken up arms against the occupying forces, whether it was sectarian, whether it was by accident, and they happen. It is impossible for me to categorise casualties in that way, or I, I, or I would put you, anybody else. And yet we judge a lot of, of our enemies, a lot of people we don't like, Bashar al-Assad. We're happy to judge their civilian death tolls. We're happy to count up how many people have died uh, in Syria uh, and here and there, but not our wars. We don't uh, count I, how many uh, died. Uh, you're putting words into my mouth which I have not used. Okay. Before we go to our panel, I just want to ask one more question about Iraq, which is the treatment of prisoners, which was a very controversial subject. Uh, the abuse, torture of prisoners in US custody and in British custody. Mm. Did you know what was going on in Iraq at the time? What you mean is the alleged widespread no, I didn't say anything about alleged I said, no, did you know what, what was going that, on? What, so in Iraq, hooding that, went on. We know that hooding went on, which was banned in the 1970s. That is what lies behind your question. So did you know hooding was going on in Iraq? No, I did not. Did you know that sleep deprivation techniques were being used? No. Why not? Because... Shouldn't it, you have known as the head of the army what certain people were doing, members of the armed forces? No, Should you because have I suspect they didn't want it to be known themselves. Any breach of the Geneva Conventions due process of law must follow. I'm not trying to excuse or condone any such behaviour. But did the army under your command, I'm talking about the army as a whole, as a, as a body with an ethos and a culture, did it do enough to prevent those things from happening? Clearly we did not do enough. OK, well, let's go to our panel. Uh, Deborah Haynes is the defence editor of the Times of London. Uh, she reported uh, from Iraq on the ground for several years. Do you think it's too black and white to judge the Iraq war as a failure or as success, as General Jackson says? I can speak from my perspective. Before the invasion happened, I, I listened to what our government was saying, and I, as a, just as a human, believed that it was the right thing to do, to go and intervene to sort of rid this awful dictator and free this country. But then having lived in Iraq um, and seen the, the, the descent into chaos and the inability of um, our government and the US to um, implement a meaningful plan, it undermined our whole, uh, the whole meaning of intervention because what we left at the end um, is not better than what was there at the beginning. And Nadeem Shahadi, you're an uh, associate fellow at the foreign policy think tank Chatham House in London. Uh, you hail originally from Lebanon. Uh, would it be fair to say uh, that the Iraq war did a great deal of damage to regional stability? I think that a future historian looking at the Iraq invasion will not look at 2003 onwards. 
One would look at the at Western policy from 91 onwards, or even from 1980. For example, the Iran-Iraq war, with uh, one and a half million dead, did not help with Sunni Shia relations. And in the same time, allowing Saddam, giving him the green light, in fact, in 1991 to massacre his people, where in a month he killed as much as Bashar al-Assad in, in three years, was, also did not help with Sunni Shia, Sunni Shia relations. So the sectarianism you saw after the removal of Saddam, it's a consequence of what Saddam did before okay. and what we allowed him to do before. Okay, so. let me bring in Frank Ledwidge, who's a former uh, military intelligence officer who served in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in the Balkans, and has since written two very uh, critical books about those conflicts. Um, when General Jackson says it's very difficult to do uh, kind of body counts and it's very hard to work this out and therefore to make a judgment call, is that a view you share? We have a duty under international law to ensure that we do keep uh, tally as far as possible those civilians we've killed. We've never done that. We've done it, of course, in Northern Ireland, but Northern Ireland's in our own country. No effort was made to do that in Iraq or Afghanistan. General, you went around the boy, as you would put it, uh, concerning a definition of, of success. We may have a problem in defining success, but we don't really have a problem in seeing failure and defeat when we, when we see it, and we see it in Basra. General Jack Keane, a four-star American general, said, Gentlemen, he said, you let us down in Iraq. You let us down badly. It's also a feeling, General, that's very, very prevalent in officers such as myself, mid-ranking officers, who've gone through these wars and have seen failure and mismanagement after failure and mismanagement. We skedaddled from Basra, tails between our legs, and left it to the Americans. But one thing which really irks many of us is it generals such as yourself appeared before the Iraq inquiry? 30 full generals. Not one of them was willing or able to say, yes, this was my baby, I take responsibility okay, well, for let, success let, or failure. Let General Jackson come back to that. You, who do you think should take responsibility? If not yourself, then who? Well, in the sense that uh, your point being that somebody somewhere got it wrong I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? I mean, in the sense that I, and responsibility, but that I responsibility was head of the army, of course, about. one is res responsible in the broad sense. But I... Um, anyway, I mean, I left in 2006. All right, well, up till 2006, then, were you responsible for the fiasco that Basra, what Basra turned out to be until Charge of the Knights? Uh, no, I wasn't. Who was? The operational commander. And I was, was not. I mean, do you accept uh, Frank Ledwidge's description? You know the chain of command as well as I do. Do you accept well, Frank Ledwidge's well, description? Yeah, I know oh, there are several yeah. chains of command. Do you accept his description that we skedaddled from Basra? I wouldn't use that language myself. But it wasn't the Richard. proudest of moments no, in British military. It was military. very difficult. Uh, Basra, a city of two million, two million. Yeah, about, about the same size as Birmingham, yeah. And simply um, for reasons which we could go into. Uh, in my view, the force levels were inadequate for the uh, nature of the task, which got more complicated um, after uh, the summer of 2003. We're putting a lot of emphasis at the moment on the military dimension to an intervention. There's political, economic, humanitarian, and if we forget the other parts, we will get a skewed and okay. distorted analysis. Because the non-military dimensions of that campaign were not properly thought through. And nor were the military implications I of the campaign. I would beg to differ with you. OK, let's talk about the war in Afghanistan, which is ongoing. Afghanistan, I think many people would say, is far from a victory. Define winning. Define your victory. OK, well, defining victory being defeating the Taliban. Have we done that? No. Um, destroying Al-Qaeda, have we done that? Not. In Afghanistan, perhaps, yes. Uh, building, a lib building a democratic nation? It's better than it was. Much better. Okay. I Educating mean, women, perhaps. Yes. Far, far better. In you know, Afghanistan... We, we really mustn't keep... You mustn't keep putting to me these biased questions. There is a balance, always a balance. 
Yes. And you're looking at the I'm downside. Yes. Be very nice. And you're to hear. looking at the upside. Well, of course, because I have to well, balance. Of course. So let's take your balance. Well, let's and if you came to say, haven't you done well with women's indication? Okay, well, I can say, I yeah. I apologize. I apologize, General Jackson. Let's start again. Yeah. Let's start again. Yeah, thank Unbiased. You. Women's education is much better than it, it was. Is, Afghan's far. government is much better than it was. We have 5,000 British troops still there, 70,000 US troops, and yet despite the progress on women's rights, you have suicide bombings up, civilian casualties up, mm. heroin production up, mm. corruption up. I would say it's not biased. I think it's just fair to say that if you look at the balance sheet, Afghanistan is not doing well at all, and we failed in our major goals. You're saying it's very imperfect. Indeed it is. But has it improved? Has life got better for the majority of Afghans? And I believe that it has. Now, is it sustainable? That's the big question. I don't think there's any doubt that life has got better. At what stage do you say the costs are too high? Even if it's got a little bit better, we've been there for 13 years. Do we, do we need to stay 20, 30, 40 years? At what stage do you say the cost well, in blood and treasure has been too high for the little that's been achieved? Well, the prize was a huge strategic prize. And let's not be in any doubt about that. Which was? Which was to prevent the Taliban regime ever giving succor again to international terrorist organisations. The Taliban are closer to Al-Qaeda now than they've ever been. We now have a Pakistani Taliban that specialises in no, yeah. suicide yeah. bombings as a result yeah. of that yeah. invasion. Yeah, indeed. So there's a big, really big difficulty with the whole of the region. It's not just Afghanistan. And what's going on within Islam itself. But that's not what we're here to talk well, about. If I we know. touch on that subject, a no. lot of experts say that interventions like Afghanistan, us being over there, is what prompts them to come over here. Yep. I.e., it's no, a Western I, military presence that acts as a recruiting sergeant I for extremists. I Do you agree entirely with? accept that is a position to be taken. And you, but you reject it. You don't share the view. <laughs> you, you use this very emotional language. I reject it. I listen to it and I think about it. Uh, Do you agree with it? It's not emotional, it's a very simple question. Do you agree well, that a Western military interventions provoke terrorist attacks and might help do. extremists it may recruit do. new recruits? It may do, but I do not see this as cause and effect necessarily. Let, you know, when you look back at the history of Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan since 9-11, do not forget that ISAF, the international force, was set up by the Bonn Conference uh, with Afghan representation post the fall of the Taliban. This was done by consent. Mm. I mean, the, the implication that it's always a heavy-handed West knocking doors down willy-nilly is, I think, That's not borne out by the facts. It's a view that was recently expressed by the president of Afghanistan, our friend and ally, Hamid Karzai, who said the British should never have deployed to Helmand. It was a waste of time. He said a lot of things which I think many people would disagree with. Yeah. Slightly awkward when the person you're saying is representative of the new Afghanistan thinks yes, actually the and, British military and, did a bad job and weren't needed. Well, um, uh, the good president uh, of Afghanistan seems to shift his ground, shall we say, from time to time. Frank Ledwood, you were shaking your head as Mike Jackson was there speaking about Afghanistan. When we got there in 2006, Helmand was a relatively stable society run by a combination of tribal gangs and drugs cartels, which made about something in the region of 20% of the world's heroin. Now it makes 50% of the world's heroin. Somewhere between 10 and 30,000 people have died in Helmand, in the most savagely violent province in the world's most corrupt country. Of course, we haven't counted the number of civilian dead. Now, if that can be characterised in anything other than epic fail, uh, one would like to see uh, that characterisation. But you're talking about Helmand. Where, where the in British were. Where we lost 450 men, you're two and a half thousand about, yes, indeed. and killed thousands. Yeah, but but you might want to think about the connection of Helmand to Afghanistan as a whole. It was a, it's a bit like your Basra piece, Britain, Basra. It wasn't. It was a large coalition, Iraq. Now, if one area also didn't disaster. didn't go as well as others, so be it. I mean, you're not going to get... So, so be it, is your answer. You are not going to get constant progress everywhere. And 
both Basra and Helmand, had particular problems which distinguished them from the rest of the country. When we do arrived you, do, in let Afghanistan... Me, let me just clarify, do you think the British military failed in Helmand, the province they went into secure in 2006? They have failed to, to produce what we set out to do, which is a secure so they environment. They have not achieved that. So that's a failure? I'm not going to concede that point. They didn't I'm achieve what they set out to, to do, concede. but they didn't fail. This seems to be kind of talk. I, I'm, why, you said let's talk plainly. Let's talk plainly. Yes. Isn't, is it not a failure to not achieve to do what you set out to do and to lose hundreds of people's lives in the process? I'm not going to accept that it's a complete failure, no. Deborah. So, Mike, did a, that was a, a good concession there of uh, accepting the fact that Helmand. You know, we haven't achieved what we set out to achieve. And that's the strongest I've ever heard you acknowledge that, in fact. The impact of Helmand and Iraq uh, on the UK public and the US public is this massive loss of trust. And I think that's going to have a terrible um, impact on future interventions like we're seeing in Syria at the moment. If we take counsel of all of that and say, OK, next time, when there may be a strong, strategic, moral, whatever, both perhaps case, to become involved. We're not going to do it because, because of Helmand, because of Basra, we will be, I think, stepping into considerable danger. One war we did get involved with was Libya, post-Iraq yep. and Afghanistan, which was a relative success in comparison. But even in Libya, let me throw a biased question at you, it took the world's greatest military alliance in human history eight months to topple a tin pot dictator in a tiny developing country. We're just not very good at winning wars these days. That is so simplistic, I, I don't know where to start. Start wherever you like. <laughs> well, the first thing is... We, it was took eight the, months. We were told it would take days by President Obama. I don't recall, but um, lots of things take longer than you think. And certainly intervention is not going to be over by Monday morning or anything like it. And anybody who's been around for a while knows that. Libya was very measured application of force. The Prime Minister was uh, kidnapped. The Interior Minister dodged an assassination attempt. Some of the militias that the West allied with, some of the uh, have turned, into, turned out to be jihadist militias controlling vast swathes of the country. It's not the greatest place to live. Even uh, Human Rights Watch, which isn't averse to humanitarian under, interventions. It wasn't great under Gaddafi. No, agreed. But <laughs> isn't that the point? Isn't that your point about making sure things are better when we go in? Your point early. Human Rights Watch says the yeah. country is sliding deeper into lawlessness. Mm. It's not the greatest evaluation no, of a conflict. No, it isn't. And it's particularly Western, I think, and particularly media, if you don't mind me saying so, that everything must be achieved by tomorrow morning. Well, it's not going to be. I'm reminded, but let's, let's lighten it for 30 seconds. I'm sure it's anecdotal, but there we are, talking about the French Revolution. Nixon says to Chairman Lai, tell me, Mr Chairman, what is your judgment of the historical significance of the French Revolution? To which, after a moment, Chairman Lai said, um, Mr. President, it is far too early to tell. On that note, we're going to have to take a break. Um, join us in part two, where I'll be asking General Jackson about his experiences and his accomplishments uh, in Northern Ireland and in Kosovo. And we'll be hearing from our audience here at the Oxford Union. That's after the break. Welcome back to Head to Head on Al Jazeera. Um, my guest tonight is General Sir Mike Jackson. Uh, we've been talking about Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, Libya. I want to kick off this part of the programme by talking to you about Northern Ireland, the conflict that happened in this country, the so-called Troubles, uh, that lasted around three decades. You served three tours of duty, I believe, in Northern Ireland. Yeah, six on, years in all. On this programme, sitting in that very chair not long ago, Martin McGuinness, the former IRA commander who's now the Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, he said to me, and I quote, he joined because the British Army, an occupying army, came onto the streets of my city and shot citizens dead before the IRA ever engaged in any combat whatsoever. What's your response to him? It is true that the British Army uh, used force, lethal force at times, against citizens in Northern Ireland. Mostly within the law, there are, again, uh, some exceptions to that, 
which I, can do, I absolutely abhor. But when you, when you look at the number of basically soldiers, but some airmen and sailors as well, uh, who served in Northern Ireland over those three plus decades, I think the record is pretty good. And indeed, Martin McGuinness's part of the population, the so-called uh, nationalists, welcomed the arrival of the British Army. In the same way that many Afghans may have welcomed the British Army. Indeed. And is, it, is there a kind of, uh, uh, is there a crossover point that you can say that where the British Army deploys in recent years, there has been this blowback effect where the actions of some British troops enables your opponents to recruit better, more easily? Uh, I think that's a very narrow analysis. Uh, and in many cases, the wrongdoings were not, did not become public for a long time. I think it's a very... Okay. Well, one that, one no, that but, no I, I need to say something else yep. about it. We keep talking about the use of the military as standalone in a vacuum. We've, we've got to do better than that. Mm. You and I have got to do better than You're that. You're referring to the political role as well. The political dimension, the economic dimension, the humanitarian dimension. Well, unless you soldier, understand so I'm asking all about the military of that. Dimension. Yeah, I know, but you can't talk about it in isolation. And in, in an intervention, the politics and the use of force have got to be absolutely hand in hand. Where Northern Ireland is concerned, there were no real politics. You were there in Northern Ireland on the ground in 1972, yep. uh, infamously on Bloody Sunday mm -hmm. when 13 civilians mm -hmm. uh, were killed by British paratroops. A few years ago, you offered uh, a, f quote, fulsome apology mm -hmm. um, to the families of the victims for those killings. But you also said it should be seen in the wider context, the context mm -hmm. that you elaborated on, that most of the British troops didn't carry out abuses, that there were provocations. Mm -hmm. Some people in the nationalist community think that apology didn't go far enough because you added that caveat. It wasn't fulsome. I said what I said, and I stand by it. Would you not give an unconditional apology? I said apology? what I said, and I stand by it. But Just, we've all yeah. moved on, um, have we not? So, Indeed. thank heavens, we have the Good Friday Agreement. Everything that went on before is imperfect, inevitably, uh, under great strain at times. But what I'm very proud of is that the British army basically was able to hold a space open for the politics to come good okay. even though it took so long you talk about pride would it be fair to say that your proudest moment as a soldier was the kosovo war and the 78 day nato bombing of yugoslavia would you say that was a success and something that you're very proud of it was my last time in command in the field which is mm. really what any soldier worth his salt is wanting to do. And I believe we were able to achieve pretty largely that which was set out to achieve, um, which was to prevent further abuse of the civilian population by the Serb forces, to return refugees to their home and to start to build a new Kosovo with uh, a secure environment. NATO still bombed bridges? bombed power stations, bombed television studios with makeup artists inside, Amnesty International accused NATO of committing war crimes during that conflict, cluster bombs were used. There were some pretty nasty things on our side of the balance sheet. Mistakes were made. It wasn't a mistake, it was deliberate targeting. No one ever said that the television studios that were blown up in Belgrade was a mistake. We were told that that was a propaganda unit that needed to be taken out, yet innocent civilians died in it. You need to read the Geneva Convention, as in some circumstances are uh, methods of propagating propaganda. So Amnesty International were talking nonsense when they said there were cases they have their for war view. crimes? They have their view. Okay. I stick by the Geneva Convention. Frank Ledwidge, <laughs> what do you make of the legacy of wars like Kosovo in relation to Afghanistan, which you're such a critic of? Well, uh, first of all, it has to be said that the general played a superb uh, role in the, in the Kosovo campaign. Uh, he, he was, um, he's, he's quite right, in a conventional war such as that, mistakes will be made. Uh, perhaps the legacy of Northern Ireland and Bosnia and Kosovo, uh, and perhaps even older campaigns for the British Army, look, look, taking several steps back, is that we believed we were capable of more than we probably were. And uh, uh, the legacy of that, or the immediate legacy of that, I, in my view, is, is failure in Basra and Helmand. 
we took on a lot more than we could chew. Deborah Haynes, you're a defence correspondent. You cover wars, wars like Iraq and Afghanistan, which are considered relatively failures. Though General Jackson doesn't like to use the word. As a reporter who's covering this thing, where do you stand? It feels to me as though the British military is um, very bad at learning lessons. Who's culpable for failure? Um, you, you never seem to get, get that. So my worry is in the future, when you do look back, um, there aren't going to be those lessons learned that are required in order to have more successes uh, like Kosovo and less failures like Iraq. Nadim Shahadi, very briefly, and I want to... Yes, acting in a, at a time when it was right to act should not be judged by the outcome. What you have to judge is whether the failure to, inter to, to intervene in such places is also m moral. Could we have yes. not intervened in a place like Kosovo? General Jackson, is it true, can I check, did you really tell Wesley Clark, the US general in charge of NATO at the time, and I believe your superior, that when he told you to block off Russian troops at Kosovo airport, you're checking your memoir, oh. a fiver. <laughs> Well, he says I did, so I take his word for it. <laughs> and had you blockaded that airport, that runway, do you think we would have been at war with the Russians? I've no idea. Okay. I wasn't prepared to take a risk which had nothing to do with what we were about in Kosovo. It wasn't worth any such risk. You were nicknamed Macho Jacko oh, no, by the British no, press. No, no, no. So? <laughs> were you pleased? Um, the British press make many misjudgments, that's probably one of them. A few months ago, the former US Defence Secretary Robert Gates uh, said cuts to the British defence budget uh, and our armed forces would limit the UK's ability to play a major role uh, on the world stage and would undermine the UK's quote-unquote special relationship with the United States. Do you share his fears, his concerns? We are heading now for the smallest armed forces we've had since the 30s at least. Is that wise uh, in a troubled, uncertain world where the unexpected is round the corner? Um, I have considerable caution thereby. Does it diminish Britain in the special relationship in the way that um, uh, Mr Gates said? Um, do you know, I don't think it does, probably. Um, Okay. The, the nature of the special relationship is as much about the political nature yeah. as, as hard power as well. Let's go to our very patient audience here. Gentlemen over here. Uh, as an Afghan, I, I feel really, really bad in heard that we are forgetting the sacrifices in the, the suffering of Afghan people. The so-called war and terror uh, 12, 13 years ago, it was nothing to do with Afghanistan. The reason the, the international community or the US NATO intervened was because of Osama bin Laden. He was found next door. The Taliban was supported, still supported, and will be supported by next door. Hundreds and thousands of lives have been lost. So I don't know why we intervened. What, is the, what was the main objectives? And what was the main reason? And why, why are we leaving now? People like myself, I met refugee. At the age of 14, I had to leave my family because of the invasion and occupation of uh, NATO and American forces. Thank you. There is much in that question. Uh, it is a, it is a, no, I mean, the, the dimensions to it are very considerable and go much wider than Afghanistan. Without doubt, Al-Qaeda were defeated after that first uh, intervention with, with the Northern Alliance on the ground, but they were not destroyed and they found succor in, in Pakistan. So you're right. The question is much wider. Why did we go there in the first place? The narrow reason, since the Taliban regime would not remove Al-Qaeda itself, the narrow reason was to kick the uh, Al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan. But then it grew. It grew rapidly. Uh, and Why didn't the West just leave then? because it was deemed that the West having intervened, it should then do what it can to take Afghanistan from an authoritarian and sectarian regime to a modern democracy. And we failed in that objective. It is a great, great challenge. 
Afghanistan is on the way. We have not failed in the way you insist on putting it so dramatically. We have not yet achieved... I'm confused at your, no, your no. refusal to define failure, and then you say failure is a dramatic word. It's not a dramatic word. No. You no, set no. an objective, you don't meet the objective, it's a failure. Violence is up, as I mentioned. We're not leaving behind a less violent country. We're but not we leaving behind a less peaceful... We are leaving behind a much better educated company, uh, 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 country, for example. You, you okay. put this Education. in black and white, and I won't have that. OK. We'll have to agree to disagree on that. Let's go to a question uh, at the back. Lady there in the glasses with her hand up right in the middle of, to my right. I was wondering um, if you really want to end the wars, because um, for me it seems we go, we produce weapons, chemical weapons, we sell those weapons to other countries, such as Syria, and then you go there and say, oh, we are not allowed to use them. So do you see this kind of responsibility Again, this is entirely a political question. But feel free but, to answer it. Yeah, but I know, I know. <laughs> uh, but I'm not a politician. No. Um, You're just a former head of the army who surely has some views on this. Yes, I do think, um, uh, in an uncertain world again, to say, to deny that Britain should ever sell a weapon overseas is frankly naive. What we haven't always got right is to whom we sell them. And I accept that. OK. Let's come back to questions here. Uh, lady here in the front row. Just wait for the microphone to come to you. There's been an absolute lack of leadership, of great leaders coming out of that part of the world. Remove Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, but where are the leaders? You have to work with what you've got. You can't invent a perfect world. You can't you conjure up. Are you a fan of Hamid Karzai? Um, he is what emerged from that process of the Afghan lawyer jerker immediately after 9-11. Do you think he's a good president? Um, that is a very loaded question. And um, the politics... No, no, don't do that. I'm not just any bloke on the street. Exactly. No, you're, not, you're not a politician, as you keep telling us. So why don't you give us a non-political answer? Because you... I am what I am. I am a retired head of the British Army. So you've got to keep some of your views to yourself? It is prudent to do that. Fair enough. L lady there in the purple hat. Definitely a military question. Are you concerned about the use of depleted uranium and cluster bombs in the Balkans, Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as the other weapons that contravene the Genocide Act, like the thermobarbic weapons that they used on the streets of Fallujah? Um, and do you think that our use of weapons that impact so heavily on civilian populations might have given the impression to other countries, such as Israel or even Assad in Syria, that the use of weapons like that is acceptable? Uh, you, you put me onto some quite technical ground. Um, depleted uranium, to the best of my knowledge, is lawful under the Geneva Convention. I don't think Britain would use any weapon which is forbidden by international law. Well, cluster bombs have been forbidden in the last few years. They've been made illegal, you say? Yes, subsequently. By? So, by international treaty. OK, uh, I wasn't actually aware of that, but if you're implying that we use... They're pretty nasty weapons. They, are they kill very, a lot of civilians. They are very unpleasant weapons, but they can also be very effective. Sorry, it's a hard old game sometimes. Use the use of force. But in any event, it seems to me this is historical because they but are to, now... But in banned. Iraq, for example, where we argued about the balance sheet, yes. plenty of studies have been done showing babies being born around Fallujah with all sorts of birth defects, deformities. A lot of American scientists have published articles on this. Does that worry you, that there may be a link to these weapons we use in and around Fallujah? Does it worry me? The I'm use... The question how you like. Yeah, the use of force... War is a dreadful thing, as anybody who's experienced it knows. It would be a wonderful thing it would never happen again, that such weapons and such a method of settling difference did not occur. But we, we live in a difficult and conflict-ridden world. Let's take a question from a man at the back, gentleman there with his, with, who's got a hand up high with white paper in his hand. My question is to General, that uh, is West doing any good by going into wars in these countries in terms of winning the hearts and minds of the people, uh, like in Afghanistan or in Iraq? Well, certainly, um, it is deep inside the British Army's DNA 
when on these sort of operations is that that is what you're about. Your, your, your objective is not Hill 123 to take it by a night attack from some enemy, probably another st uh, state's forces. It, the battleground is people's minds, their attitudes. You want them to think that the future is going to be better than what is so often a pretty miserable past. Gentlemen here in the jumper second row, do you want to wait for the mic to come for you to my right? What about more recent interventions like the one in Mali, where Western forces came in to help and support a democratically elected government? Do you think that is more virtuous, um, probably promising more success, or is that just like any other yeah. intervention? Yeah, uh, but, 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 but thank you for the question. Um, more often than not, intervention by the West has been by invitation, and quite often with the UN Security Council resolution behind it. Kosovo was an exception. Um, I mean, to those of you... But you don't mind not having UN resolutions? Of course one minds. We had a long discussion about the legality it's of Iraq. A, it's a very, you you, you use some very strange language. Um, <laughs> uh, one has a care. One, one wants the best context you can get. But funny old thing, I detect the majority view in this hall is that Iraq was illegal. I've given you my own reasons for uh, not believing that to be so. Um, without doubt, it would be, you would be very pressed to make a, any uh, sense of a case that Kosovo was legal, but it was widely deemed to be legitimate. Perhaps now, the legal and legitimate, ideally, should be one and the same thing, but they are not. Okay, let's go to the gentleman there in the check shirt, just to the third row back on the left. It's been estimated that it will cost approximately a total £100 billion to upgrade Britain's Trident nuclear weapons system. Mm. Do you think this is money well spent, given the possibility of a global nuclear weapons ban? Thank you. Uh, I am absolutely hard over on Britain remaining a nuclear weapons state. Uh, I dispute the 100 a uh, billion pound, it depends over how long that is as well. If it's over the full life, which could be 30, 30 to 35 years, uh, that's three billion pounds a year. I do not regard the cost argument as really of any weight at all. Why does the UK government get to have nuclear weapons and say the Iranian government doesn't? Well, because we chose to so equip ourselves. Why can't they do that? Because because governments which are irrational, who have nuclear weapons, or who may become irrational, uh, pose a particular threat. Uh, and I'm afraid, you're not gonna like what I'm gonna say, I suspect, but we have uh, Iranian leaders who clearly think it was a very bad idea that Israel was ever invented and they look forward to the day when Israel will be disinvented. So take Iran out of the equation. Can other countries who don't say bad things about Israel, can they have nuclear weapons? Um, well, we, we, have a, we have the non-proliferation treaty. Whereby we get to have nuclear weapons. That is what else the does. treaty set up. OK, I'm going to take the gentleman there. Um, do you think that the failure to find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and the way that certain people like Baha Musa were treated by British soldiers has diminished the credibility of um, the British army and of British foreign policy to the public. And if you accept that, what do you think needs to be done for that credibility to be restored? We know that Saddam Hussein had had them. We know that he had used them, not only in the Iran, Iraq, war but against his own people uh, in a pretty bestial way but the intelligence was there that he had continued not only had he had them he continued to have them we know now that intelligence to be flawed and incorrect it was not known at the time uh, when it was clear that there were none to be found after the invasion, I accept 
that not only Britain's reputation here, but the coalitions took quite a knock. Bahamusa is a source of great shame that British soldiers mistreated prisoners. Uh, and the rule of law must be upheld. There is no, there is no condoning such behaviour, other, otherwise we uh, cease to be what we are, which is the armed, the armed forces of a law-abiding democracy. General Jackson, just before we finish, you spent 45 years I in did. the military serving your country. Uh, you saw people die in various conflicts, soldiers uh, under your command, enemy soldiers, civilians. How do those deaths affect you as a person? Very personal. <laughs> um, soldiering is a hard business at times, and casualties are inevitable. But you know that when you take the Queen's shilling in the first place. It's part of, it's the hard part of contract. And one of the great things about retiring from the army seven years ago was saying to myself, I will never have to write another letter to the next of kin without doubt a relief. At the same time, there's, there's a danger that soldiers sailors airmen who may become casualties are seen as victims can i beg you all of you in the room and to whomever you sp this is not what they're about they are not victims only in the sense we are all victims of human nature for which sadly conflict seems an ineradicable dimension you once applauded quote the urge of red-blooded men to want to fight in wars. And I wonder, earlier you said that war is horrific, no one wants yes. to go to war. Yes. So where does that urge come from, given war is always an evil? Sometimes it's a necessary evil, but yeah, it's always an it, evil. Yeah, no, we need to be very careful that it can be the lesser of two Agreed. evils. And, and we but need why to, have the, the red-blooded urge to fight? Having fought their first battle, uh, they've had that, uh, dare I say, somewhat youthful uh, enthusiasm uh, tempered by the reality of a battlefield, which is uh, uh, almost inevitably um, a dangerous, frightening, and unpleasant place. That doesn't mean to say they changed their minds, but they matured, they grow up. They're not for the urge of it, they're doing for the duty, and that's, what they, that's why they joined. On that note, we'll have to leave it there. We've run out of time. Thank you, General Jackson, for joining us this evening. Uh, thanks to our audience here in the Oxford Union, to our panel of experts. Thanks to you all for watching at home. Uh, this debate will continue as ever online. Good night.